Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hey there, I'm Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that shows you how to optimize your health and get the most out of your high intensity training and start and grow your HIT business. My former guests include the who's who in HIT, people like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan. Health and fitness and nutrition giants like Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, successful HIT entrepreneurs and exercise scientists like Luke Carson, Dr. James Fisher, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld and many, many more. This podcast is also brought to you by the HIT Business Membership. It's an online blueprint to help you grow your HIT business, including exclusive content on sales, marketing, hiring, pricing, retention, and personal training, monthly Q&As of experts, high-grade community full of thought leaders, and HIT entrepreneurs. If you're interested, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership. Today's guest is US board-certified orthopedic spinal surgeon and a thriving type 1 diabetic Dr. Carrie Dayulis, about how she uses the vegan ketogenic diet along with specialized insulin strategies to manage her diabetes and feel better overall. I saw Carrie's Twitter handle, um, which, uh, sorry, Twitter bio, which basically says board certified orthopedic spinal surgeon, spine wellness care and healthcare, uh, thriving type one diabetic plant-based keto. And I was like, yeah, you know, I definitely need to talk to this person. She looks fascinating. Uh, so really glad we got connected and got to talk. She's an absolutely fascinating individual. If you want to connect with Carrie, please go to Twitter at C-A Diulis, D-I-U-L-U-S, or Instagram, Carrie Diulis MD, Facebook, Carrie Diulis MD. I will provide all the links to those pages via the show notes for this one, which will be over at corporatewarrior.co forward slash Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E. As I said, she's a mega fascinating lady. I'm excited to bring you this episode today. We talk about Carrie's personal journey and how her diet has evolved over the years, how she uses a very particular diet and tech to manage her insulin, her views on the debates in diet, particularly the controversy surrounding high protein, exercise and strength training, and much, much more. Carrie, I'm so sorry I am publishing this so late in the day again. Guys, another one from June, July 2018, I believe, maybe a little later than that. But again, uh, this one is is published a bit later in the day. But all the same, it is a fantastic episode. Carrie is just really interesting individual. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy listening to her views on all things diet, exercise and wellness related. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Carrie Dayulis. Carrie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be able to be here. Oh, so pleasure is all mine. Um, 
I have a feeling based on the last tweet you sent me before I uh, logged into Skype that you're going to convert me to being plant-based in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> My goal is never to convert anyone. Oh, no? Oh, no. no, it's just to dial in what works best for individual health. And that's where testing and measuring will answer it. It's not about one way is the right way or one way is the wrong way. So, yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, just to give, I guess, listeners context, you've got such a fascinating story. Um, I, I know you've probably said this a number of times on, on, on other shows, but it would just really help, I guess, to understand um, your background in terms of your career, your professional life, but also your own health journey you've been on as well. Yeah. So, you know, for me, my health journey really started when I was 12. Um, I have a lot of obesity in my family and I actually went on my first sort of formal diet then when I was, you know, which was the Pritikin diet, which for those who don't know is very low salt, low sugar, plant-based, low fat. Um, it was pretty horrible. Um, but I did manage to, you know, lose weight at that point. And I, I really, I gave up meat at that age, mainly because I didn't really like it. And so that was not a, an important thing for me to keep in my diet. And then sort of fast forward and some things that happened in college. And I ended up in college about a hundred pounds heavier than I am right now. Wow. Um, and there's a whole lot behind that. But, uh, in medical school, I lost the weight. I went back to running a lot and training a lot and actually was on the, um, amateur national team for duathlon one year. Um, and, you know, it was sort of on autopilot at that point into, I was a pathology resident. So I trained as a pathologist before I trained as an orthopedic surgeon and injured my knee. And that sort of ended my sports career in the way that I thought it was going to unfold and decided to go back to what I had loved in medical school, which was orthopedic surgery. And I thought I was going to end up being an orthopedic sports surgeon, but ended up falling in love with spine surgery and the patients and the nuance of it and the science of it. And so I did my orthopedic surgery residency at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and then the, uh, after that, I did a spine surgery fellowship um, in San Francisco. And during that time, I got pregnant with my daughter um, and I gained 60 pounds with that pregnancy and then had to lose that. And that was a struggle and a challenge. And then the same thing happened with my son, despite the, I gained 57 pounds with my son because I was super careful with what I was eating. Is that mediated um, by calories or is that mostly hormonal? Like, how does that happen? Yeah, you know, so for me, pregnancies were a disaster. So I'm not, I love my kids dearly, but I would not go back to being pregnant if someone paid me and my husband's had a vasectomy, so there'd be far too many questions <laughs> to answer there. Um, but, you know, I wonder now with what I know about what works so well for my body, if I would have a different experience. Um, but I'm not willing to run that one experiment. Many others I'm willing to run that one. I'm not. Um, so there's a lot of factors. There's hormonal shifts. I mean, the body, it's a whole thing that happens during pregnancy to support the infant. Um, and then secondarily the post, <laughs> um, but so then I was on staff at the Cleveland clinic as a spine surgeon, um, after my husband was in the military. And so we, we did all of that for a while and then came back to Northeastern Ohio. And while I was there, I was actually out, I was talking nationally about how we use sort of plant-based diets, although I always leaned towards a lower carb version of it um, to help reverse the symptoms of type 2 diabetes and optimize surgery. And I went for an executive physical and they said, oh, your A1C is elevated. I'm like, that's not even possible. This is what I do. And so, you know, I was sort of misdiagnosed as moving in the direction of type 2. And as it turns out, type 1 diabetes, it's a continuum as the beta cells are losing function. So we just happened to catch it early. And so ultimately, I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. And so right now, on the last test, my pancreas doesn't make any insulin. 
Right. Um, or at least, at least if it makes some, it's like super, you need an ultra sensitive test in order to pick that up. And I haven't had that done because it's not going to change anything. You, you were diagnosed in your late thirties, right? For late thirties. Yeah. How rare yeah. is that? I've never heard that before. So it's actually a, a fallacy that it's mostly kids. So there's newer data that are showing that there's equal distributions across age groups. The problem is there's a lot of people who are diagnosed type two that are actually probably type one, but the assumption is that they're type two because they're older and they're obese. And so what we find with those patients are that they sort of rapidly need to go on insulin, that regular medications don't, you know, the metformin and the other medications don't work well for them. Um, and I, I do have um, a family history of type one. I don't actually have a family history of type two of any significance. Um, plus, I have celiac disease, so the they share some common genetics where the two go together. So about 30% of patients who have type 1 have celiacs also, which is gluten sensitivity. Um, so, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there that are, have been diagnosed as type 2, and they do have insulin resistance. So type 1 is where the pancreas doesn't make enough insulin, and it's usually an autoimmune condition although there's a few other conditions that cause it. And then type 2 diabetes is an insulin resistance factor. So you can actually be a type 1 that becomes a type 2, or you can be a type 2 that's also a type 1. So, you know, it's the combination of them. My goal is to, you know, not become insulin resistant, which can happen easily when you're giving exogenous insulin. So the first thing that happened when I went on insulin was I gained 10 pounds immediately. Oh, wow. And so when we look at the insulin theory of obesity, for me, it's a no-brainer. The more insulin I'm giving, the more I see the scale go up. So my goal in my sort of daily life is how do I tweak things so that I can minimize the amount of insulin that my body needs but still gives it the appropriate amount so that I'm thriving and healthy and building muscle and all of that. That's so, that's so interesting. And um, just one question on the, uh, uh, you know, the diagnosis. Did you, so it sounds like it's purely genetic or did you have, looking back prior to being diagnosed or, or discovering that you had type one or developed type one, um, was there also lifestyle factors you believe that may have led to that? Yeah. So it's, you know, there's a lot of studies around why it is. So we're seeing this huge increase in the amount of people who have type one diabetes. Um, it's shockingly high and we're seeing that across the board with autoimmune conditions. So there are a lot of factors, you know, there are studies looking at the gut microbiome and, you know, I didn't follow the celiac diet while I was in residency because, I was working 120 hours a week until they changed it so that you could only work 80 hours a week. <laughs> um, and then I was pregnant. So, you know, I basically with residency and training, I didn't sleep for 20 years. And I was one of those people that said, you know, hey, I'm going to get my workout in. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Push, push, push. I was the only, you know, like there are very few women in orthopedics. So I always had this belief, like I have to be faster, better, stronger to hold that place. And so I think a lot of those things were factors that led up to it, stress and sleep, and then becoming a new mom. Like, I think all of those things were factors while being a resident and being married to a surgeon who was deployed, you know, in war, like there's plenty of stress reasons. Mm. What ultimately said, I got the flu and that was what sort of like the influenza virus and that was what sort of tipped things at the end. So there's a lot of factors. It's hard to pin it down and they've tried to pin it down to one factor. And, you know, especially since a lot of kids are diagnosed with this, people try and, you know, there's a lot of guilt and blame on parents. Like, is there something they could have done to prevent it for their kids? And we don't know the answer to that yet to be yeah. able to say, you know, I still check my kids. My kids are at risk because of my genetics. Um, so I test if they fall down and they get a cut, we check their blood sugar. Just, you know, if they get sick and are acting weird, I'll check their blood sugar. But I haven't figured out anything other than a super clean diet and 
healthy living that I can do with my own kids to prevent it from happening. So, you know, since, since obviously the diagnosis, um, you know, you made some changes to your diet and to your lifestyle. Um, can you talk, can you elaborate on that and just describe how I suppose your diet's evolved and some of your lifestyle changes you've made? Cause you look really healthy now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really cool to see. And clearly you've kind of personalized this for you. So I'd love to learn more about that. So when I was initially diagnosed, there was some stuff that I could clean up in my diet at that point. Um, I had let some more processed foods come in and I had been stress eating more. My job was sort of super stressful at that point And I ended up shifting my job after that, which was a good thing for me from a stress standpoint and lifestyle. From a dietary standpoint, when I was first diagnosed and we thought it was type two, I sort of did what I called a pescatarian paleo diet, which was really heavily plant-based, healthy fats. And then I had some fish. Um, and that was just preference, not ideological or religious. You were just... No, there's no... For me, I mean, there's a whole... Yes, I we have a, we have a zoo at our house of animals. Like, I love animals. <laughs> I've also, you know, in my past done surgical research in an, in an animal lab. So... You know, and when we talk about the ethics of, you know, animal-based diets and plant-based diets, you know, Paul Hawken is a guy who I respect greatly who's got a book called The Drawdown. And, you know, we talks about um, moving towards, you know, reducing animal consumption, but it's not zero. And when we produce plants, a lot of times fertilizers are animal byproducts. So for me, the ethics of it and the, like, we need to revamp our entire food system if we're going to save the planet, really. And we need to treat animals ethically. So that's just to get that piece of it off the table. For me, it was about, I just tend to lean towards feeling better when I'm eating more plants. And so at that point, my goal was, okay, I'm going to eat a ton of plants and have some protein that was fish based and some healthy oils, but it was lower on the fat side, although not low fat. And I wasn't, my blood sugar just kept going up and up and up until then the wheels came off. And so then right after I was diagnosed, I followed, I was given insulin. Here's what you have to do. You know, you need to make sure that you're getting enough carbohydrates so that because insulin, it's hard to balance the amount of insulin that you give exogenously. Like the body is brilliant and the body does this really well. And even under the best of circumstances, we don't match insulin with carbohydrate as well. Because if you take an apple, how long does it take that apple to absorb? Did you eat it with peanut butter? Did you eat it on a full stomach? Did you go for a run after you ate the apple and that slows down digestion? There's so many factors. And Insulin is an incredibly powerful hormone. So, you know, I have a fatal dose of insulin attached to my body right now in a pump. Um, Because if you get too much insulin, it can be fatal. So the initial teaching before we had pumps and before we had these ways of microdosing insulin was that you had to eat a certain amount of carbohydrate so that you could get the insulin in and so that you could give the minimum dose And now there's a lot of newer insulins and newer technology and more rapid acting insulins. And it's gotten easier. And I've actually shifted to where I'm using a pump and an automated insulin delivery system that um, is open source code. That's fascinating watching it. It's an app. There's two different systems. We could get into that later if you're interested. But So hold on, that's actually like plugged into you right now. Yeah, so I've got a (laughs) pump that... Um, so there's two systems, there's open APS and then there's what's called loop L O P. Um, and they both have algorithms built into them. It's open source code. It's all been by diabetics and people who know and love diabetics who created these systems and open APS it uses. So I wear a sensor on my arm. That's the Dexcom, which is a continuous glucose monitor. And that continuous glucose monitor sends data to the cloud and or my phone And then the two different systems can pull that data. So the one that I'm currently using right now 
then I play with both of them back and forth is the loop system. So it's kind of dirty in this little box here, but there's a computer in here. And so it goes to an app. So she's that, holding up a tiny little white hold, box, yeah, the size of a tic tac container. Yeah, it's the size of a tic tac container. So I build an app based on the open source code that then takes the data from the glucose monitor. It analyzes using its algorithm where my blood sugar's been, where it predicts that I'm going, and every five minutes it decides how much insulin I need. And it sends the signal to the little computer with the lithium battery in this box. And then that sends the signal to my pump and adjusts my insulin up and down. So if you don't mind me asking, like, where is this attached to your person, the actual pump itself? The pump is on my stomach. Okay. And then we're not filming, so I can kind of, sorry, I have the pump. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So the pump, it's one of the older pumps that the code was able to be sort of hacked into. So I have it on my stomach. You can put it on your leg. I used to use the Omnipod, which was a tubeless pump. And I have to say, I prefer that because with as active as I am, like yesterday I went for a run and it started pouring rain while I was running. And I was like, don't get wet. pump. <laughs> <laughs> You're old. You're tired. Like these pumps are old that we're like buying from other people to hack through the system because the FDA right now, the, the automated insulin delivery systems that are available commercially set the blood sugar goals at 120 for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, I have my blood sugar goal at 85 because your blood sugar is probably right around 85. And so my goal with all of this is to minimize the risk of complications and to live as normal a life as possible. Got it. So back to what we were saying. So initially I tried for like a week or two, maybe a little longer. I tried eating the carbs that were recommended and dosing the insulin. And with surgery and everything I was doing, I would be you know, bouncing between 40 and 400 in a day. And it was like an up and down roller coaster. And I was like, this is just silly. Is that millimolar? Sorry. Uh, sorry. No, that's in uh, milligrams per deciliter. So oh. I forget. Or milli sorry. milligrams per Because uh, I think about, oh, I say I think about things in millimolars. That's probably the second time I've used the word millimolars. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe it's 13. I don't know. I'd okay. have to do the conversion. Hmm. Um, is my high and like, I don't know, two is my low, you know, it's, okay. it was a wide range. Before I had gone on insulin though, I had been super low carb because originally I sort of left that piece of the story out. So originally I was like, this pescatarian paleo thing isn't working. I basically went almost no carb at that point. And it helped for a while. And then, like I said, then I got sick and the wheels came off. So then I went on insulin. I followed sort of the ADA guidelines. And that was a disaster. And I quickly said, all right, I'm going back to low carb because I can do that. And it dramatically improved what my blood sugars were. And I varied between, you know, having about 25 to 30 grams of carbs per day, mostly from leafy greens, to t t times where I would do almost zero, where I would be fairly, you know, carnivorous during those times. And for sure, my blood sugars were easier to control. Um, the thing that I noticed was I just didn't, I, my blood sugar was easy to control, but my energy level wasn't great. And markers like my high sensitivity CRP, I could get that finally below three, but I couldn't get it below like 1.5, no matter what I did. And so I felt decent, but I got sick all the time and, but I, you know, I, I played with it and I was starting to gain weight and then I was trying low carb, high protein, low carb, high fat, like which of the two of them was better for me. Um, I did, you know, the bulletproof coffee for a while and it was great from an energy standpoint and from a cognitive standpoint. I find that I do much better when I have my own endogenous ketones than when I'm using MCT oil quite as much. And I started to gain weight. Mm. Um, and that for me is something that, you know, and as you gain weight, then you become more insulin resistant. And I started needing higher doses and it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Got it. So then I got sick with this other virus and it was a bad one that sort of hit a couple people in our area. And 
I ended up in DKA. And after that, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and after that, I my got a post viral gastroparesis, which is basically where, you know, because why not? I didn't have enough going on in my life. Um, so your stomach, the the virus impacted the the nerve that was controlling my stomach. So my stomach just stopped working, and I struggled to get in any nutrients at all. And I was rapidly losing weight, and it was hard to balance insulin because I never knew when anything was going to absorb. I didn't know when protein was going to absorb or carbs. And if I didn't figure out how, you know, with the weight, the rapid nature of weight loss, if I didn't figure out how to reverse it, I was going to end up, you know, needing a feeding tube. And that was not something I was interested in. So I started, it was all, I could only do smoothies. Um, and protein was just bad for me. And my stomach reacted really poorly to it. And I've never, I don't, I have an allergy to dairy and eggs. So those weren't really options. And at first I was just putting, I bought from a specialty lab, like purified amino acids and used those in small amounts and was gradually able to increase those. And ultimately I was able to add plant-based proteins back easier because I could tolerate them. And so fast forward, I was able to tolerate some fish, but I wasn't, I'm not still, I just don't have a taste for it. And I wasn't a huge fan of it. And it was so much easier for me to do plant-based proteins that I said, all right, I'm just, why am I fighting this? I'm just going to embrace it and do it. And it wasn't really even a conscious decision. It was just, this is what works. And I don't want to have to think about this. And it, it ended up being, you know, I was using pea protein and, Um, I avoided soy for a while. I'm fine with soy now. Um, but ultimately it worked so well that I rechecked some of my, my labs and my high sensitivity CRP went down to like 0.2, which means, you know, a dramatic decrease in inflammation. My energy levels were up. My insulin levels were as low as they'd been. I was making gains in the gym that I hadn't made in years. And I sort of shifted my workout at that point. So I can't say it was purely related to that, but it's certainly, you know, I'm 40, I'll be 45 in a couple of months. So, you know, making gains in the gym as a middle-aged woman is something that caught my attention. Um, so I've just stuck with it since then. And, you know, I supplement with some algal oil to get enough omega-3s and I would probably be fine using fish oil, but I kind of, wanted to hold this space to see, you know, what happens. And so far with everything that I'm doing, and I sort of pay attention to the literature on mTOR and I cycle protein, um, you know, and protein is a funny thing. It comes, we see it. I'm, I live in this sort of weird world where I have friends who are super carnivore and then friends who are like raw vegans. <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing is, is I, and that's why I say none of this is a religion because there are people thriving on both ends of that extreme. So the human body is incredibly adaptable. And I think figuring out what works best for you at this moment in time is what is important. Five years from now, my diet may look very different. I have no idea what it'll be. I just keep measuring the markers and what I find is I sort of have a sweet spot where my blood sugar is easy to control, especially with the loop system where I spend days now. I just, my husband and I just got back from Spain and we climbed a, a mountain and I, I, lo I watched my blood sugar just because I wanted to know what it was, but I didn't once shut my pump off myself or bolus. You know, I get spikes when I go when I get adrenaline or have exertion, if I do a heavy leg day, I get a blood sugar spike. Or if I do high intensity interval training, I get a blood sugar spike. I didn't have to mess with it. So for me, low carb, and in this particular case, plant-based, and then add to it this automated insulin delivery system, it's been phenomenal. So, you know, hormonally now, my hormones are, I no longer am sort of premenopausal. Um, I don't worry about my weight anymore. I'm still making gains in the gym. So I just keep holding the space until I get some feedback from my body that 
I need to shift something. So, so many questions come up for me. I didn't want to ruin your flow because yeah, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I didn't. No, I'm glad I didn't because, um, you know, I, I don't want you to lose that. And, and that was really interesting. It's fascinating, actually. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, is this is a, a common issue that I have personally, and I'm sure some of my listeners have. You know, I was just, I was just uh, on a call with Ivor Cummins recently, um, mm-hmm. who you might be familiar with. Yep. And, um, you know, Great he's talk, a, that he wrote. Sorry? His book is great. I love his book. I recommend it to patients all the time. Oh, cool. I literally got it through the post this morning, so I can't wait to read it. Um, but he's a really cool guy and a really smart guy. You know, he's, we were talking about, he's really got the toolkit in terms of like understand, being able to interpret research because he's got, you know, he's got the training in statistics. He's got this background in engineering and complex problem solving. Um, and, you know, myself and obviously many people out there really lack the skills. And what occurred to me, actually, I was thinking about this today, is um, there's a lot of people out there who may be quite smart, but they're not as smart as they think they are. And they're, you know, shipping the science around and, and uh, presenting the science um, that they think is, is, is like uh, conclusive or whatever to, uh, and aligns with a certain point of view. Um, and I just think, how many of these people are right and how many of these people are wrong? You know, how many of the people out there looking at all the literature are doing it in a way where they are actually deploying all these different skill sets properly? Like, well, it would seem like Ivor is, right? Right. Um, anyway, I'm kind of digressing here, but I just noticed there's a bit of a conundrum. And, it, and the reason I bring that up is, is, like you said there, you've personalized your nutrition, your exercise approach to yourself, uh, and you're super open-minded and you're adapting over time in terms of how your body responds to that. How might the layman, how might someone like me understand? Because I I just, you know, I talk to people like Ted and he says, yeah, eat steak and eggs. So I'm like, okay, I'll go and eat steak and eggs. And, and I, you know, I do that and I look at my physique and I look at how I feel and I think, oh, this seems to be working for me. And maybe that's enough. But I'm just curious, you know, if I really wanted to optimize for myself mm-hmm. and I guess for the listeners, what's the best way to do that? So that the... Out? First simple question for me is how do you feel and what are your energy levels? Um, And then, you know, there's what's the scale doing and how's your sleep? Those are all, you know, and as far as sleep, it's sleep can impact diet. I mean, there's no time that I crave carbs more than if I haven't gotten good sleep or if I'm jet lagged or whatever from travel. So those are the simple ones. But then there's some lab tests that you can do that are inexpensive. Um, High sensitivity CRP being one of them, which is a marker of inflammation. Now, if it's low, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have inflammation. There's other, you know, ways to measure that. But if it's high and you are able to bring it down, that is a significant thing. And it's a relatively inexpensive test. And at least in the United States, most insurance companies will cover it. Um, fasting blood sugar and fasting insulin levels are other ways to dial in what your body's doing metabolically. Um, and you know, again, there's some other micronutrients and things like that, that you can look at. You can get really into the testing. I mean, when I was sick, we tested what my actual amino acids are. And interestingly, this, and this is where, so the whole science of it, the issue is, again, there's not one right answer. And the human body is super adaptable, or we wouldn't have had people who survived in super cold climates like the Inuit, and also people who are able to survive around the equator. Like Again, that's why our species is able to exist, is because our bodies can shift. And just this past weekend at a uh, major nutrition conference, there was a study that was presented that showed that, you know, we don't see the amino acid deficiencies or protein deficiencies in vegans who have adequate calorie intake. And you start to look at the protein science and you're like, well, how does that work then? Because they're not necessarily getting the, you know, and why is it such a wide range? You can't, go to a source and say, this is how much protein you should eat for an optimal diet. And depends on what your goals are. So that what that study showed is that the microbiome actually changes and it's the amount of cellulose that's ingested that shifts. Inulin didn't do it, but that cellulose ingestion that's high shifted the microbiome 
and that it was the change in the gut bacteria that were able then to maintain good protein status and amino acid status despite a lower intake. So, you know, the stuff gets fat. Why is it so confusing? It's because there's not one answer. And the problem is, is the way research is funded and the way people's careers go, you know, and the fact that we all have this tendency to want to prove our own hypotheses right, which true science would be where the money is just available to do the quality research. And our goal is to disprove our hypothesis because that's when the real truth comes to light. Um, so that's where it's, it's tricky to be able to say, hey, this is the one right diet for you. So if I see a patient in my office and 75% of my patients are obese or have some degree of metabolic syndrome or diabetes or obesity, I start with where are they at with things? I'm in the Midwest in the United States, which is sort of like the corn fed land. Um, And so I'll ask them, you know, we can shift the cell membranes, the receptors at either end of the spectrum. So we can make the body super insulin sensitive on a very, very low fat plant-based diet, or we can shift to where the body is burning predominantly fats on a ketogenic type diet. And then the, you know, seed oils with the polyunsaturated fats and all that comes into play. I think we need to decrease those in everybody's diet. Um, But I sort of ask them, where are you at as far as psychologically, what's going to be, we have to shift something because you're not doing well right now. And I leave it up to them whether we move them more towards low-fat plant-based or towards a ketogenic diet. And again, the ketogenic diet can be plant-based or animal-based. And then we check in and we see how they feel and we measure, you know, what's going on with their fasting insulin, what's going on with their fasting blood sugars, what's going on with their high-sensitivity CRP, their homocysteine, a few other, and how do they feel? And what's the scale saying? And so... It's hard for me to say there's one right answer. And then the question becomes, what are your goals? If your goals are you want to look, you want to grow as much muscle and be as lean and ripped as possible, that may be one dietary pattern. But the longevity data doesn't necessarily overlap with that. So that's where some of, you know, is the longevity data is starting to look at, you know, some methionine restriction and cycling of mTOR is probably better. There's a higher protein need after you're 65. Um, and that data seems relatively clear. The, the, all of the lipid stuff is just sort of a disaster right now. <laughs> just to dig into the protein for a second. Yeah. Um, about the whole mTOR thing. So I discussed that with Ivor a little bit. Um, I know there was some, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm a bit stupid when it comes to this. So pardon me if I slip up. Um, but if you're uh, activating, shall we say, if that's the right word, yep. and the mTOR pathway um, too often with protein, large protein intakes, then that it seems to be fairly uh, counterproductive to health span. Um, however, in in much, I guess it, largely myself, I'm thinking about here and my community, um, will intermittent fast or do you know have mm-hmm. a very pulsatile approach to eating. So I yep. personally eat two meals so a do day. I. Okay, so I eat two meals a day. I do at the currently quite high protein. Um, you know, I was doing, you know. I, I weigh 155 and I was doing 165, see if that would make a, a change to, to lean gains, um, which it, it, it probably didn't. Um, and, but, but, I, but, you know, I do have protein does dominate my plate in both of those meals. Now, curious, what are your, so in that context where you are kind of cognizant of um, uh, that kind of mTOR activation and just making sure you're having it in a pulsatile manner, should we be, uh, do you, in your mind, should we, is there any concerns around high protein intake? So, you know, again, the, none of the literature is conclusive on it. When I read through it and I look at what do I want to do for my own health, um, I think cycling mTOR is probably the best way to go. We don't want it off all the time because sarcopenia of aging, which is reduction of muscle as we get older, is a very real thing. And it leads to hip fractures and spine fractures and 
shortens your life. I see it on MRIs every day when I look at people's MRIs where their, you know, deep core muscles are replaced by fat. And that's a problem. So we want to build muscle, but mTOR on all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, I think is a problem also. And that's where it looks like the literature is directing us. So what I personally do, I find, you know, when I was low fat and higher carb, I was hungry all the time. Um, Being plant-based, low carb, in ketosis all the time. I intermittent fast. I usually, my day is super busy. So I usually have black coffee in the morning and then I have dinner when I'm done. And that's when I have my protein and I try and get at least 2.5 grams of leucine with a meal so that I'm then turning mTOR on you know, once a day. And then when I do, I do a a high intensity interval training workout at least once a week. Um, And on those days, I'll have a protein shake in addition to some extra branch chain amino acids, because I want to maximize what I'm gaining from that workout. I always spike during those workouts too, from a blood sugar standpoint. So I'm also giving insulin so that all of those things I think together may be part of the reason why I see gains in strength and, you know, I'm leaning out even more in the gym. So the the answer, I mean, we don't have the definitive answer on mTOR yet. um, As far as, you know, we, it seems from a longevity standpoint that having mTOR off is a good thing. But like I said, I, as an orthopedic surgeon, realize the benefit of mTOR being on through a cycled process so that you can make gains. And then, you know, I do a five day sort of modified fat water fast, although I eat some food every month. It helps. Yeah, it helps to keep me super insulin sensitive. And, you know, if you look at Walter Longo's research, um, it, you know, a cell autophagy. So, you know, cleaning out. So there's mitophagy and autophagy where the body sort of cleaning out what's not useful and what's not up to par. And then with the refeed stimulating stem cells so that you're sort of renewing and repairing. I do it more often because from a blood sugar standpoint, I feel like once a month is sort of my sweet spot, but it's different you know, for others, how often he recommends people do that. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've not dug into much of his work, although I've been told a lot about it. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I, I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan, as the mm-hmm. listeners will be sick of hearing. And uh, I know he does a, a, a kind of monthly, I think it's three day fast. Um, and I think a weekly, uh, sorry, a week fast every quarter. Um, <laughs> and I have, I have fellow, I mean, I'm pretty, um, I'm a bit of a hard gainer when it comes to gaining muscle mass. Um, and I think, you know, and I've got plenty of colleagues who are too, and, <laughs> you know, they, they, they've done, they're, they're smart people. I mean, there's one who comes into mind in particular called Skylar Tanner, um, it's a good friend of mine. And, you know, he, he was, he's, he made a funny joke, which he said, Oh, I did a, a seven day fast. And funnily enough, my muscles didn't fall off. And I think a lot of us hard gainers, you know, we were worried that we're going to lose our muscle mass. Um, do, can you just talk a little bit about why that's probably not the case? Do you understand much of the science? around around that. I don't know if I'm coming out of your area of expertise on that, but I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what we mean by the word fast. Again, um, it, a pure water fast plus electrolytes. Um, you can go for longer periods of time. You know, again, the body is way smarter than we are. And what we understand about nutrition and longevity and all of this, honestly, is like, the shadow on the wall of the tip of the iceberg. And so we're still trying to, you know, get through all of the science um, and figure out what is the ideal for, you know, as I always say, the patient I'm seeing at three o'clock on Tuesday, you know, which may be different than myself, which may be different than you. Um, So, you know, as far as why does muscle not, you know, the body, it depends on how quickly you shift into ketosis where your body is able to burn ketones. Um, and looking at the fasting data on what percentage of 
muscle is lost versus what percentage of fat is lost. Um, it shifts over time. And so in a short fast, you're not going to necessarily, initially your body may break down some more muscle in order to have, it depends on what your glycogen stores are, first of all. So the liver is where we store sugar and that's readily accessible. And in the absence of eating, the body needs to keep, the body keeps a, a blood sugar that's relatively regulated within a tight range. And, you know, red cells are an example of cells in the body that need to have sugar. The brain, for the most part, can shift from burning sugars or burning fats. And most cells, the muscles can shift from burning cells to burning fat, from burning sugar to burning fats. It takes about three to five days to shift over that machinery. So what's on the cell receptor and what are the enzymes within the cell and in the way the mitochondria are burning. Um, so that's why people on a shorter fast will not necessarily feel good during that time. Their blood sugar can go low. Their ketones aren't yet high enough for them to feel well. So it, the body will, you know, in order to make enzymes, you need amino acids in order to the body can convert amino acids into sugars if need be. So that's where we start to see some loss of muscle. Um, you know, again, but then if you're, what it looks like from some of the data is that if you're doing a short fast and then a refeed, that especially if you're then lifting in the gym. So let's just be clear. It doesn't matter. There's no perfect diet for building muscle if you're not stressing the muscle and working out. Like people will ask me, what do I need to eat to build muscle? I'm like, you need to go to the gym to build muscle. <laughs> well, you're very true. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're fit and healthy, your body wants to keep muscle on you. It's metabolically not smart for the body to tap into muscle as its primary fuel. That's what body fat is for. And so by fasting, if you're driving your insulin levels down, you're going to be using less fat or sorry, you're, you're going to be using less sugar to burn. You're not going to break down as much muscle. And then your body starts to, when insulin's low, the body taps into your fat stores. So during that time, you know, from a prolonged fast in somebody who's lean, for sure, the body starts to break down muscle and we get, you know, cachexia. What, what time span are we talking about? It depends on the person. It depends on what, I mean, I see obese people who have albumin levels, which is a measure of their protein stores of like 2.5 and they're, they have plenty of calories, but it's mostly processed carbs and, you know, polyunsaturated fats. And they look like they're starving, but their weight is elevated and they don't, you know, these are people we see problems with healing and it's, you know, they don't do well from surgery. So we want to, just because somebody isn't super thin doesn't mean that their protein stores are good. So we need, I mean, at the end of the day, we need quality food and, you know, whole natural real foods that are on the planet that we've evolved eating and, you know, then dialing in the science from there gets based on what environmental exposures you have, what, what's your age and all those things. So as far as muscle wasting, it depends on where you're coming into it. You know, if you're a middle-aged woman who's never lifted weights and you are, you know, carbohydrate centric and you starve yourself we're, you're going to see muscle wasting. If you're somebody who's lifted weights on a regular basis and you, you know, do a three day water fast, you're not, there's not going to be a huge percentage of muscle that's lost. And oh, by the way, the body wants to keep muscle on. So if, you know, mytophagy and I, I and an autophagy have happened, and then you refeed and you get a stem cell release, your body's going to rebuild what is necessary. So then the question becomes, you know, all of the gains in the gym, is that necessarily your body's goals for your own longevity? 
right? So just because our desire is to be a particular weight or have a particular physique doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you know, the most appropriate body habit is for your individual genes. So I could get you super bulky with exogenous testosterone and growth hormone, and we could make you big fast. Not necessarily a good thing. No, I, I, I totally appreciate that. And, um, you know, I've never, I've never been interested in that. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of like people who are really obsessed with this stuff, obviously experiment with that. But uh, I have zero interest. And I think the, the vast majority of my listeners feel exactly the same way. So when I talk about optimizing the aesthetic, I'm really talking about it in a natural context. Um, so but I do I, I would I mean, maybe we're, we're talking about the same thing, but we're I'm not fully understanding you. But, um, you know, it's my my understanding that if you are able to achieve your own muscular potential naturally, mm-hmm. then that should optimize your health span um, in a in a it's really obviously like, um, you know, it's high, oversimplification probably saying that, but in terms of obviously the muscles being so important in terms of physical capability and in terms of, um, uh, improving the cardiovascular system to deliver nutrients to the muscles. So if you maximize your potential naturally, that would seem as it's my understanding that would optimize health span or be one of the things. Am I incorrect saying that possibly or? Yeah, I mean, do we have the data to take two groups and make one group, you know, falsely, you know, really bulky and really muscular and, you know, follow them for a lifespan for me to be able to say, you know, what is optimal? I think we know that what is optimal is, again, low inflammation. Um, If you're working out excessively to try and make bigger gains, you may actually be doing detriment. And we see that with people where their cortisol levels are off, their sleep is off. Um, So it's what can I mean, for me, at this point, my goal is to work out as much as I enjoy working out. I'm super busy. So it's how do I work out as little as possible to get the biggest gains so that I can be running around playing with my great grandchildren and not worry about falling and breaking my hip. Oh yeah, no, I totally get that. I mean, just for just for context, I mean, I work out every six days. Um, Got it. In a high intensity strength training fashion, so I think Body by Science Big Five is probably a good reference yeah. point. Many of my listeners work out once or twice a week in a high intensity strength training fashion, so they are totally on board with the uh, low lowish or, or moderate volume. Uh, low frequency, high yep. intensity approach to training. So none of them will be doing, or very few will be doing kind of daily training, apart from maybe Ted Naiman. <laughs> so I played with it for a while. I have in my bathroom, I have a pull-up bar, oh, cool. and then I have the jungle gym or whatever. It's like the TRX system. And I have to say, for me, pull-ups, um, I tend to do those more days of the week than not to failure and sort of with a super slow eccentric and sort of half of that on the concentric. Um, and that again, as a, as a woman, I felt like that was helping the most with my upper body strength that, and then I do like a row on the TRX and because of Ted, I started doing handstand pushups and it's just fun to freak everybody out when I'm like, hey, look, how many can I do now? <laughs> um, I haven't fallen on my head yet. Um, so, yeah, I think optimizing it, you know, we spend too much time sitting. We don't spend enough time exercising. We sort of got into this sense where, you know, I, I was an endurance athlete. I figured it was calories in, calories out. So if I want to stay fit, the more I work out, the more I can eat and the leaner I would be, you know, there was just a study that came out in cell that showed that there's benefit to endurance exercise. There's benefit to high intensity interval training, and there's benefits to strength training. And they're all sort of nuanced differences with regard to the mitochondria, but they all have benefit. So for me, a lot of endurance training, what I found is if I do stuff, if I work out too often in the gym, or if I run too long, and by too long, I was doing ultra marathons for a while, um, my inflammatory markers go through the roof. 
So like this morning I was going to, you know, work out later today, but I use, I'm using, I'm the aura ring. I'm, I'm getting it, but on my heart rate variability testing this morning, it was low, which is in general an indication of, you know, there's something up. And so I've learned that if I I don't sleep well, you know, before I just used to push through and say, I need to go to the gym. I have to do this. Um, now I read those. If I didn't sleep well, if my energy levels are off, if my heart, resting heart rate is higher, if my heart rate variability is lower, I bag the workout for that day and say, nope, I'm going to go back to the gym. You know, I tend to do my workouts on the weekend just because it's easy. So, you know, the body by science, I love that. That's great. I use that with my patients. I actually have it on a handout that I give my patients one of the like web links that That's great. they had. Um, and I, I, again, at, I've injured myself. I've lost more time of my life from injury with that happened in the gym and through sport than I would like to. And so my goal now is to work out as hard as I can, as little as I can to get the maximum benefits and minimize the chance of injury. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance both positively and negatively, 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Um, Interested in talking more about that if we've got time, but I really want to make sure I get a view on your current diet. Because we talked about, yeah. you gave a great like history in terms of how it's evolved through your life and following all the different experiences you've had, which is so interesting. But what, so can you talk me through, because... 
I know, I noticed I, I liked a YouTube video which went to my Twitter feed, which I forgot that happens. Um, and then you, you commented on it and said, this was before I went totally plant-based. So yeah. I, I know you talked a little bit about your diet in that interview with Mark Hyman, who I think is a great guy, yeah. by the way. Um, but I, I'd love to hear what your diet looks like now. If you could just give us a snapshot of an average day, that'd be really cool. Yeah, so that was before I got sick in that video. Right. Um, so I was having some fit, mostly fish. I would have some you know, meat with most meals. And I was higher protein at that point. So what my, you know, I have black coffee for breakfast. Um, I typically don't eat anything then until the evening on weekdays, sometimes on the weekends, it'll look different. Um, so I'll have a big, huge salad. I mean, my salad is the biggest mixing bowl that I have. And I throw kale and collard greens and I mean, like if, if it's at the grocery store and it's green, I chop it up and throw it in there. So there's broccoli sprouts so that I'm getting sulforaphane, you know, to activate NRF2 pathways and, you know, all of those things to get super sciencey. Like my meals are science experiments, <laughs> um, but I like the way they taste. So I have a giant, huge salad um, with all, you know, non-starchy vegetables in it. And then I will usually have some sort of protein. So the proteins that I'll eat are, um, I do fine with soy. I haven't found it to be a problem. Again, that's one of those things that I think it's, I only do non-GMO soy. Um, but I'll have black soybeans, which have almost no net carbs. I'll have tofu. Sometimes I'll have some small amount of tempeh, um, hemp seeds. Um, hemp foo is a type of like tofu that's made out of hemp seeds. Um, there's a bean called the lupini bean, which has, um, zero net carbs. And again, carbs can't hide from me because as a type one diabetic, if they're in there, I have to give myself insulin. Um, such inchy seeds are a seed that, um, have a good protein mix, a good amino acid mix and is bioavailable. Um, there's some baru nuts that I'll use and other nuts and seeds, um, if I do a protein supplement, I usually have a mixture, um, of pea protein and, you know, something I, you know, to give me a good mix of amino acids, there are some vegan, um, branch chain amino acid supplements that are out there that are, you know, I'll use that on my heavy lifting days. So, you know, I'll make a big, huge salad or I'll, you know, roast some vegetables in the winter. I tend to like stuff to be cooked in the summer. I tend to like stuff, I eat more raw, um, just again, preference. Um, and then I put healthy fats with it. So I'll put olive oil with it, avocados, nuts and seeds. I'll make dressings with, you know, cashews or macadamia nuts where I'll put them in the Vitamix and, you know, add some liquid to them and maybe some red pepper or whatever to make it something that I can pour over my salad or my vegetables. Um, and I have some chocolate almost every day because I like chocolate, but it's stuff that I make, which is with raw cacao and, you know, uh, cocoa butter and, um, uh, coconut oil. And then I sweeten most things with stevia I've started to play with monk fruit a little bit more, um, some erythritol. And then um, there's a company, No Better Foods, K-N-O-W, that has um, a sweetener called Allulose. Um, a lot of their products have eggs in them, and I don't tolerate eggs, but a lot of my patients like it. Um, so, you know, that's my basic day. I don't, I try not to eat. I'm not a fan of the processed vegan. Like, I think that's a huge problem there's a ton of crapitarians out there and those foods, you know, I don't like, there's no seed oils at all in my diet. Um, the only oils I use are, are coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil. I will use MCT oil, particularly the C8 oil. If I, for whatever reason, want to bump my ketones up most of the time I'm in ketosis and I don't need to worry about that. So that's what my day looks like on the weekends, on Sundays, when I tend to do my weightlifting, I'll eat earlier in the day because I'll have a, I work out fasted and then I'll have, um, protein within half an hour or so of finishing. Um, you know, we do go out. If I go out, I tend to get vegetables and I am one that 
doesn't necessarily trust the oils at restaurants. So I have been known to have my own oil and that in my bag that I pour on vegetables and salad that are there. No, that's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I, I, I could see you were kind of like, um, was shy to say that a little bit, but, uh, I think that's totally, totally reasonable and, uh, a fair thing to do. Um, just very curious, and maybe this is a stupid question. Does this mean that you don't ever touch any refined carbohydrate or no, um, never. junk food? Basically, never. No, I mean, no, not, because for me, the carbohydrate just means I have to give myself more insulin. And so, you know, I did my my dad died earlier this year and I'm it was sort of a time. Oh, that's a people were bringing food over and some of it was gluten free and I tried some of it and then I ended up chasing my blood sugars more. And I'm like, this is just not it it, for me. Do I think I have to be as strict as I am? You know, I think there's again, some variation with it, but it's about, I'm super busy and I don't want to chase my blood sugars and I don't want to have to mess with it. So it's just easier not to. And the cravings I used to, like, I used to think you had to be a special kind of stupid to forget to eat because I was hungry all the time. And now like all of those cravings, you know, there was a period of time where I was up in the middle of the night eating and I wasn't even like, I don't usually talk about this, but I wasn't even really aware that I was doing it. We would wake up in the morning and be like, Oh, that's what I ate last night. That's not good. And to the extent that we put like bike locks on cupboards so that I wouldn't eat while I was sleeping. I'm like, what do I do with this? Yeah. Yeah. It was, a thing. I, yeah. So, and that made like blood sugar management super challenging for a little while, but I don't do that. Like I don't crave things. I don't eat unless I'm hungry. All of that just stopped when I got everything dialed in, like all of it stopped. So I think, you know, when we talk about emotion leading and things like that, I, I think that food does play a role in it. In addition to emotions, because I have just as many emotions now as I had before. And I don't do that anymore. So either I got old and that went away, I don't know, but I don't have those cravings anymore. I'll have some berries every once in a while if I want something sweet. And we usually keep like blackberries and strawberries around the house. Um, I'll make treats. You know, I can make, I can make cauliflower into just about anything at this point. <laughs> um, Do you make cauliflower base. mash? So cauliflower mashed potatoes, I have made them. I'm not a huge fan of them, but I make just about everything else with them. I made this mock egg salad that I found the recipe for recently that used cauliflower. Um, I put cauliflower, steamed cauliflower in my kids' smoothies, and they don't even know that it's in there. And you can make an awesome ice cream tasting stuff with with, uh, avocado and raw cacao and stevia. So if I want something sweet like that, I'll do it. But there's the other piece of it is that I have to take the time to make it. And sometimes I'm like, eh, mm. I'm too lazy. And then the feeling that of wanting that will just pass. And like I said, I always keep chocolates around because that's kind of my end of the day thing. And sometimes I'll have some red wine, mm. not a ton of it. Um, just because then, you know, I don't feel great. I've learned. I'm like, I like the taste of it, but I, you know, I get a headache the next day and I'm like, I'm saying, I don't need it. I'm saying, yeah. I'm, I'm, as I, as I get older, I just, I, I just find alcohol less and less appealing. Um, it's, it's, it's the, the, I always say the gaps between when I drink just get larger and larger. So I still do it, but yeah. the gaps are bigger. Like, you know, one month becomes two and two becomes three and so on. Yeah, and we keep, you know, we have wine at our house, red wine, like good red wine. We just like the taste of it. Um, so I'll have some sips of it here and there. You know, my husband is sort of our thing on the weekend. We'll like pour a glass and then it'll sit there and we'll both walk past it and take a sip here and there. And, you know, but it's rare to have like, I, I just can't finish a full glass of wine at a meal. I don't feel like I just don't. Fair enough. Um, a few things I just want to touch on before we wrap up, Carrie. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you this because I w- I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't um, with regard to spine health. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you get a lot of, uh, it's quite fashionable right now to have an inversion table and tip yourself upside down to, yep. um, 
guess, decompress, if that's the right word, the discs yep. in your spine. Um, and obviously that's, that's uh, you know, some people will use that after, say, a weight-bearing activity, like a heavy mm-hmm. day of squats or any kind of heavy loads above the, you know, the shoulders. Um, what's your thoughts on inversion tables for spine health? Is it really important? You know, I don't have one. I don't use one. I've never used one. Um, I don't really have the, the budget for one right now. So am I at a loss? So what's your thoughts about those? Okay, so I'll start it with saying I don't have one. I don't use one. Oh, God. <laughs> um, but I have a lot of patients who really benefit from them. So, you know, when we think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, we the, so the discs, the anatomy of the discs are that discs get their nutrition through a pistoning action. There's not blood vessels that go all the way through to the middle of the discs. And when we spend all day sitting or even standing in one place, anything that's not dynamic, the discs aren't getting the nutrition that they need. And there's a lot of factors. I mean, there's a lot of studies now on omega-3s and advanced glycation end products and how all of those things are impacting spine health. Um, The benefits of the inversion table are that it can cause decompression. So it can cause stretching out of the disc and it can open up the frame. And so the discs lie in between the vertebral bodies and then the nerves, the height of the disc determines the amount of space for the nerves that go out at that level. And so I find a lot of patients who do get some relief of their back pain and some even from some nerve related pain by using an inversion table. And so some of it could be increased nutrients. Some of it's the mechanical change of going from upright to lower. And if you look, when you talk to people who talk about inversion tables, like a lot of times they'll tell my patients they have to be hanging upside down and really you just have to be off neutral to get some pull through it. So I often will tell people, go try one. And if you like it, get one. There, you don't have to spend a lot of money on them. You don't need a ton of bells and whistles. You need something that you can safely get in and out of and something that you'll use. Um, so I do find patients, I have yet to get to the point where I can say, this is a person who absolutely won't do well from a spine standpoint. There are some blood pressure issues and some vascular things that hanging upside down may not be as beneficial for some people. And I had one little sweet old lady who got stuck in one for a while. So (laughs) I always say, you know, make sure you can get in and out of it. I don't think it hurts. If they're going to spend time doing something, I think they're better off spending time, you know, lifting weights and doing high intensity interval training. If we're being real, like my goal is to try and increase my patients type 2B fibers so that if they fall, they stay upright and don't break things. Yep. But inversion tables, so long way of answering that, yes, they can be helpful and give some people relief. Do Does everybody need to have one and be hanging? No. If your back feels fine, then, you know, there isn't, I think you can get a similar thing from being in water. Mm. So because you're unloading mm. the disc. And so I'll have some patients. So if the dis- we don't have a great treatment for a young person who has disc degeneration where the disc has started to wear out and where there's inflammation in and around the bone, we disc replacement surgeries are controversial. Fusion at that level is controversial. Stem cells are controversial, whether they'll be helpful. And that's a whole separate topic. But I do have patients who find that either an inversion table or getting in the water and doing sort of water jogging can be helpful for unloading that disc and decreasing their pain. Very cool. Are there any other, I mean, apart from potential pain relief, um, are there any other benefits, do you think, to to potentially health span with stuff like uh, inversion tables or activities that mimic that, um, what what is it, that unloading of the spine? Yeah, I mean, so the less pain you have. So I always tell my patients, the more you do, the more you do, the less you do, the less you do, and the less you do, the shorter you live. Um, It doesn't make a cute little soundbite, but it really, so for me. (laughs) Yeah, that won't be the quote of the episode. (laughs) That's not the quote of the episode, but the reality of it is anything that you can do so that it keeps you more active 
the long, the better for your health span and your lifespan, unless you do too much crazy stuff and die of an accident related to that, right? So if using an inversion table helps people stay more physically active because they have less pain, then I think then that for me, I can say makes sense as far as increasing health span. I can't point to, if we go back to this, I put my science hat on, I can't give you any science that says hanging upside down like a bat is going to make you live longer. I just <laughs> like, it, I, I'm not, maybe there's something there related to that, yeah. but to me, it's more, if you find it's pain relieving and you know, as a species, we didn't like hanging upside down is not something that we normally do. So I'm not hanging upside down. If I get back pain, though, I probably would go out and try an inversion table and mm -hmm. so that I could keep working out. Although for me, again, it's more about inflammation and how do we use the diet to decrease inflammation, and stress and sleep and all those things. And as we already outlined, you know, probably the most important thing, uh, and I'm going to be biased and say this, is strength training, um, which is ideally targeted on your back. So uh, obviously we know that you can get, um, you can activate a lot of the musculature there with a seated row type motion or ideally a MedEx lower back or a Nautilus lower back machine. Um, something like that. So that would obviously be, be more ideal. Um, but, but even body yeah. weight postures, you know, True. I have, you know, I have people do sort of, you know, a warrior three, um, my old people, I have them hold on with one hand and do opposite arm, opposite leg to sort of activate the multifidus. And then, you know, we're really good at strength training in the, the sort of frontal plane, we're not good side to side. So, you know, clamshell type exercises or balancing half moon, which is a yoga position where your legs out 90 degrees and now you're working on your lateral quad, you're working on your, your gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. And then you're also, you've got your adductors on your downside leg plus your obliques are all involved. So I'll have them hold positions like that. That's not going to help necessarily for those fast two B fibers. But it helps to strengthen that. And then I have them go into a, a standing split position where, again, they're stretching their hamstring on the one side, but they're sort of increasing their gluteal strength on the lower side. So the gluteus muscle, like the, the combination of the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and gluteus maximus is a lot of times people mistake injuries to that for back pain. Yeah. And... So I spend a lot of time with patients. So the QL, we want to, you know, there's issues with the QL, the multifidus, you know, keeping that strong, and then the whole gluteal complex. Like that's what I spend my entire day with regard to the lower back focusing on, and then the neck is a whole separate discussion as well. You no, know I meant to ask you about the whole functional medicine piece because I know mm -hmm. that you're obviously an orthopedic a spinal surgeon, um, but you also, from what I understand, you also – provide almost like a consultancy to people in terms of alternatives to surgery like diet sleep exercise lifestyle now curious do you get a lot of pushback from the medical community on what you do because they might see that as being outside of your expertise i put that in air quotes right um, because it's maybe a conflict of interest or so here's the reality when we get so tunnel visioned in medicine where we think, oh, you have spine degeneration and that's your only problem. And the reality of it is patients will come in with metabolic syndrome, with diabetes, with sleep apnea, with, you know, they're on a statin and, oh, by the way, they have lumbar stenosis and, you know, maybe they have kidney disease on top of it. And all of those things impact how well they're going to respond to any treatment. So, you know, for me, a lot of it started around dietary changes with metabolic disease, but it was also statins. I see a lot of patients who are on statins that have things that their primary care doctor send them to me because they have leg pain when they walk and they have an abnormal MRI because, well, almost nobody has a normal MRI over 65 of their spine. And they assume that it's from that. And I stop their statin and their pain goes away. So there's a lot of stuff for me looking at the bigger picture. We know that patients who are diabetic, if their A1C is elevated, they do poorly with surgery. So I always sort of joke that I'm the outlier in everything 
that I do in medicine because as a woman in orthopedics, there's only about 7% of orthopedic surgeons are women. And then as far as from spine standpoint, to the best we could figure, I was about the seventh woman trained in the United States as a orthopedic spine surgeon. So that already made me weird. And then <laughs> I do all this dietary stuff with people. So initially it was, you know, I was sort of off doing my own thing. Um, and sleep is a factor, but we didn't get, I did some functional medicine training and I've been incorporating a lot of that stuff for a long time into my practice with my patients. Um, the really cool thing that's happening right now is at least within orthopedics, although it's happening in other things, bundled payments have happened. So if you operate on a patient as a hospital, you get a certain amount of money, regardless of how much it actually costs to take care of that patient. And so if a patient has a complication, if they end up in the hospital longer, if they get a wound infection, if they get a wound problem, you don't get paid any more. So all of a sudden, there's a really big push for how do we get people healthier before we operate on them? That's great. So it's not necessarily altruistic. Like we should have been doing this long ago. Yeah. But all of a sudden, there's this renewed interest, not renewed, but new interest in doing all of that, which is why I spend a lot of time speaking at national academic meetings about how do we optimize a patient before surgery so that they have a better outcome. And there's more research, even that's just come out in the past year, like I said, about how advanced glycation end products lead to spine degeneration, and then how beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the ketones, although it's not really a ketone, but... That's a separate discussion. Decreases inflammation and can be used to decrease pain and all of those things. So, yes, I, mean, I don't know. I long ago stopped caring what people sort of thought of me because at the end of the day, I want to sleep well at night and I want my patients to do well. So we just try and connect. Um, and if I, you know, I, I had a patient just this past week, he didn't need spine surgery. He changed his diet. He went on a ketogenic diet. It was an omnivore based ketogenic diet. He lost 30 pounds. He, his pain is gone. He just ran his first 50 K and an under eight hours and had never done anything like that before. And so I get to have all of these super cool experiences with my patients where they're really happy and spine surgery is sort of known for everybody knows somebody who had a spine surgery that they wish they hadn't had. And my goal is to have as few people as possible at the end of my career that say that. And if people come out of seeing me and they can shift and increase their own health span and longevity, then I'm fine with whatever anybody says about the wacky spine doc who's talking to patients about what they eat and how to sleep and all that stuff. Oh, that's very cool. Um, final question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask the uh, I'll ask you where the listeners can find out more about you, Carrie. Um, what have you changed your mind about regarding health and fitness or diet in the last twelve months or in recent memory? In addition, or if there isn't anything, maybe you've already explained that. Um, but I guess in addition to what you've already said. So something something that you haven't said already would be would be interesting. Yeah, I mean the lowest hanging fruit one for me to answer with that is that, you know, I thought you had everybody thinks that you have to be eating a lot of animal protein to be low carb and in particularly on a ketogenic diet and that you know it's just it's funny because again even the the plant-based people say, "Oh, you can't do a ketogenic diet and be plant-based. And again, there's a lot of pushback in the low carb community about, you know, you can't be plant-based that you're going to, you know, cannibalize your muscle. And again, so all of those things are things that I've just not seen, but at the same time for me, there's, n there's not a definitive answer that I've come to yet where I say, okay, this is it. This is the way I'm going to live the rest of my life. So, you know, if I wake up tomorrow and I have labs that say I need to add animal protein back, I'll add it back. I mean, I think that's the single biggest lessons that I've learned over time is that I used to work out too hard. I need to really guard my sleep as one of the most important things if I'm going to be a good doctor, a good mom, a healthy person, a good wife. Um, and so, you know, understanding that is important. And then, 
again, dialing in, you know, and doing plant-based low carb is not like the hundred level course. Like if you avoid soy, you can potentially have issue with lysine. Although again, I've never seen any documented lysine deficiencies. And I've had people say that, you know, oh, you can't be plant-based because you don't get enough taurine. Well, the body manufactures taurine and we don't have taurine deficiencies and that there's no carnosine in a plant-based diet. And the body actually, when you eat something that has carnosine in it, the body breaks down the carnosine into the amino acid components of that. And if you, if any carnosine is absorbed into the blood, there's an enzyme called carnosinase that breaks that down. If you don't have that enzyme, then, you know, there's learning disabilities and mental retardation that happen as a result of that. So the body breaks it down and then it rebuilds it. So that's the biggest thing that I've learned because I really have spent this past year trying to understand amino acid science in a deeper way than I did. And the more I learn, the more questions I have. Which is always the way. <laughs> right. Which is good. I think the day I wake up and I'm like, oh, I have no more questions, then yeah. I'm like... Life becomes a bit pointless and boring, probably. Yeah, really. Like, why? <laughs> um, what about, and maybe you've already answered this, but what about um, like vitamin B12? How do you account for that? Right. Yeah. So there, there's no question about it. So when we talk about deficiencies in the diet, I see people who eat the standard American diet who have a ton of deficiencies, yeah. you know, so really... Yes, there's no good way to get B12 without supplementing it in a vegan diet. No question about it. Um, the other things that I get pushed back on are omega-3s. Well, you can get those from algae sources. Um, vitamin D, um, you're first of all best off to get it from the sun. I supplement all of my patients with vitamin D because we're in northeastern Ohio. And I mean, you're in the UK, like there's just not enough sun to get optimal levels. Um, and there's plant-based sources of that if you want to hold that space, which again, I am just sort of for the sake of doing it. Um, K2 is a vitamin that um, comes from, it's in organ meats, it's in eggs, it's in Japanese natto, the bacteria make it. Our gut can convert K1 to K2. Um, so you can supplement with that if you're taking higher doses of vitamin D, and that's important for bone health and cardiovascular health. So yeah, there's nutrient deficiencies. I've been able, you know, Marty Kendall, I don't know if you know him. He's got the nutrient yeah. optimizer. Yeah. And it was really, I will plug things into chronometer to see where I'm at, you know, as far as zinc and copper ratios and, you know, all of the amino acids and play with that to optimize it. And so I do think that there's something really important about optimizing nutrients. And I think we're much better off to get it from whole food sources than from supplements Again, because we don't fully understand like the beta carotene study. There's a beta carotene. There's a study that showed that people who had carrot juice, women who had breast cancer and people who had lung cancer who had carrot juice daily, I forget for how long it was, had a lower risk of recurrence. So they thought it was the beta carotene. So they gave people beta carotene. And what happened was they had a, just the opposite happened. So there was an increase in recurrence of breast cancer, an increased recurrence of lung cancer. So oh. again, that's why I say- Is that due to like the crosstalk or something of the, the beta carotene within the carrot juice with other thing, phytonutrients or other yeah, things that, that we don't so know about? Again, that's, I mean, there are like 10,000 different phytonutrients and we don't fully understand all of them. And yeah. the whole concept of lectins and some people are sensitive and some people are, aren't like, those are all legitimate things. And that's why I say we're still really in our infancy when we're understanding the science. So it's a problem for me when we try to dial down into these like like super nuance this particular nutrient. I think it's about the whole balance and again how the gut microbiome plays in with that is really important, but whole plant-based foods have those phytonutrients and I think that's important. Now, can you get that on a carnivore diet? You know, again, I'm watching like everybody else is. That's not my I didn't do great when I did that. I, my energy levels weren't good, but I'm certainly paying attention to what other people are doing. And, you know, can we say there's not, you can't get B12, so a vegan diet is not an appropriate diet? Sure. And do I think that the probably 
most people would do well on a fair amount of plants. And this is not everybody. Again, it depends on your gut microbiome and, you know, all of those other things, but more phytochemicals and some quality sources of protein. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, they'll do well with that. But obviously, that's not the case. And even some plant foods like flax seeds, flax seeds and I do not get along. I can eat fiber all day, every day from like cellulose sources, inulin type sources and like flax seeds. And my husband sleeps in a different room because <laughs> you know, it just my it breaks me like resistant starch breaks me. <laughs> Whereas, but I can eat, you know, leafy greens and jicama and all of those things all day and not be bothered. Mm -hmm. But so, I mean, I think it's important to figure those things out and, and, you know, dial in the nutrients. Like I said, I, I plug stuff into Marty's nutrient optimizer and that was, you know, I don't use that more. Yeah, it was super cool to get to, you know, because then again, I get sciencey and do we know that those are the optimal, you know, like what does it actually mean? I don't know, but it's cool just to run through the mental exercise of how do I increase my nutrients and what does my day look like with that? Like I ended up adding endive because it was a green that I hadn't thought of before that, you know, bumped up my nutrient profile. So I, I must say that like, um, just sorry, sorry to cut you off. Were you? Yeah, gonna, yeah, for sure. No. Um, I, I, no, I'm just thinking about what you're saying about in terms of, you know, um, just to kind of summarize there, you know, it sounds like you, um, you know, you, you don't eat any or much in a way of meat because, because of how it makes you feel and the energy. And I can relate to that. Like, um, you know, um, if I have a large, a large meal, which I, you know, if I have two meals, I, I might have quite a lot of meat, quite a lot of protein and I will feel sluggish. And, I can't put my finger on it. I've not been sleeping great lately, if I'm honest. And there's some other, we've got a, a bathroom, like an ensuite bathroom next to our bed, uh, sorry, our bedroom. And uh, it gets quite damp. And I think there may be some mold issues. So I'm, I, yeah. I need to address that because I think that's yeah. actually serious. Um, so yeah, it's one of the, again, coming back to, you know, all the different variables or different factors, it, it's, it can be complex, right? Um, and I'm not as smart as you, so it's even harder. <laughs> and um and anyway, I'm digressing, but I want, I, 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 I'm trying to ensure I don't get um, tunnel vision with the whole high protein thing. And, and sometimes I think, you know, is it, is it normal to feel sluggish after a big lunch? Is that just normal? Especially in the afternoon when you consider that most people say, oh, you, you know, you're most productive between, you know, 8 and 11 a.m. in the morning. And then afternoon is a, a, a kind of more, uh, a less energetic period, perhaps. Uh, and I was starting to think that, oh, well, if I actually tweak my diet, maybe I won't feel so sluggish between the hours of like one and four, you know? Four, yeah. So, what so do I you can think? tell you, I don't, I don't feel that anymore. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I know. And, oh, wait, I lost my little <laughs> Like, I can't, again, my goal is not, I, I, I hate how we get into these religious camps yeah. in nutrition. Like, and my goal is not to convince anybody or to, bring anybody over to my side. It's just like, Hey, this is how I feel really good. And if you want to try it. So my response to that would be play with it and see how you feel. And, you know, so I don't, again, most of the time I fast throughout the day and my energy levels are great. I don't, I intentionally stopped if I eat lunch. So my office staff totally laughs about it, that if I get a break during the middle of the day and God forbid, I, you know, back before I would eat lunch, like my clinic would shut down because I just couldn't, I would go slow. We'd run an hour behind. I just couldn't get it going again in the afternoon hours. But now I just pound through, don't eat until I get home, but I don't get tired until bedtime. So again, my energy levels are just so much better than they were. Carbs for sure would, you know, you, it's like, you know, here in the States, we talk about Thanksgiving dinner where, you know, you eat all that food and maybe some of it's the tryptophan from the turkey and the gravy and all of that stuff. But I eat huge quantities of food. Like my salad bowl is, you know, like, wrap my arms around it. It's that big. It's like a Marxism. What do you call it? A big old salad or. Yeah, I'm not Bad sure. I don't know. I've never seen, yeah, it's. Just, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, my husband does the same thing. It's funny because he's been 
playing with a lot of this stuff himself. Like he found his energy levels are better when he doesn't have gluten or, you know, he's moving into it like a fully ketogenic diet at this point. Yeah, I mean, that is totally undisputed. Like, you know, you cut out that stuff, you feel so much better. Um, You know, like I will occasionally have, um, you know, like a cheat day or treats on like on the weekend on a Saturday and maybe treats the wrong word. But, um, you know, I might I might indulge in some of that stuff. And, you, you know, you can't you can't avoid the the crappy feeling afterwards um so so compared to that i feel amazing day to day and now i suppose i'm really trying to optimize for me at this point yeah i mean here's my thing is just play with it and see how you feel like i think we get to i guess i'm just as guilty of it because i'm staying totally vegan to sort of hold this space to say hey you can do it and feel good and if i stop feeling good or i start getting sick on a regular basis like that's Again, I'm the canary in the coal mine, I feel like, when it comes with this stuff. Um, and, you know, that's my blood sugars will go off easily. And I, like I said, if somebody's around me, I get sick. But now I haven't, I feel myself fighting things off at times, but I haven't gotten really sick in quite a while since I've been doing this. And my energy levels are good. And my days are, I mean, I finish surgery and sometimes, you know, I'm under lights and I'm working hard and it's, I'm dripping with sweat because it's really physical and it's mentally challenging. And I don't, I'm not tired. You know, I go home and I, you know, will work out or whatever if I, you know, feel like it or go for a walk in the evening and, you know, eat dinner and, you know, yeah, at bedtime, like I fall into the bed, like. I lay down and I'm asleep. Um, And then I wake up early in the morning. I just tend to be a morning person. So uh, usually between 4.30 and 5. uh, Most days before 5. Even on the weekends, I tend. I mean, I'm I'm just one of those early morning people, although my preference is to work out later in the day. So if I force myself to work out. Sorry. Yeah, no, in the... We joke, my husband stays up later, so I most days am asleep by 9 30. In the winter, it can be closer to 8 30. <laughs> um, like big nights for me, or I'm up until 10. <laughs> <laughs> and again, because I know my brain functions so much better and my energy levels are better if I get quality sleep sure, and it's been totally fun. Good. Use, yeah, using the sleep trackers to dial that in and. Do you know what, Carrie? I hope you don't. Uh, I hope, hopefully, this will make you laugh and not offend you. Uh, but I, I really think you're like a fusion of like Dave Asprey and Rhonda Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> if they had a baby, well, I respect both of. Them. If they had a baby, well, I'm older than both of them. I think. Yeah, that's why it was kind of. I, I wasn't sure whether to say that, but I just said it anyway. So. <laughs> And I respect what they both are doing. Yeah. You know, Rhonda Patrick is super smart. David Asprey is super smart. And, you know, they've figured out what works for them. And, you know, we all, if you look, though, at the three of us, there are some really glaring similarities and there are some things that are different. And that, again, sort of goes back to my, like, try it and play with it and see how you respond. So, yeah. no, I'm not offended at all. I'm actually, that's a great thing because <laughs> I, I respect both of them. No, I, I do too. And, uh, I don't know either of them, but I respect both of them. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's a really good point to end on, you know, in terms of personalizing it for you and not to get too obsessed and too upset when you can't um, optimize perfectly because everyone's kind of winging it to an extent and no one knows all the answers. Um, so, but that's per- perhaps just one of the you know, the, the, um, interesting things about life, I suppose. Um, Carrie, what's the best way for the listeners to find out more about you? Um, so I post a lot of what I eat on Instagram. I'm still trying. I always joke that I'm trying to learn from my teenage daughter, how to most effectively <laughs> utilize social media. What's your um, handle? Uh, Carrie Daulis MD okay. is Instagram where I try and post recipes of foods that I eat. And then, uh, Facebook, I have a page which is kind of a hybrid of patient related things and sometimes foods. I do less of the food pictures there. Um, try and post more science, like informational things for my patients there. And then Twitter, so that also is Carrie Diulis MD. And then Twitter is C A Diulis, um, which is, you know, sort of where we all banter back and forth around 
the science of things. And I don't know, I try not to argue. I try to just say, hey, I try to be the positive voice and say, here's what's worked. If that works for you and you're feeling well, then great. So I think Twitter, yeah, Twitter is an interesting place. Like for me, I'm not massively active on there. I mean, I am on there. Um, I promote my stuff on there and I find it really easy to connect with like with people like you. I mean, this is how, that's how we got connected. Right. Um, it's actually the best place I've found for recruiting guests on the podcast. Um, it just, yeah, it just seems to be, uh, you know, certainly high profile people seem to be quite accessible on there for the most part. Um, but, and, and, and I do, I do enjoy the banter, you know, the, 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 the joking that goes back and forth. Um, I, but I find it from a, um, and I do find it good, and I'm sure you find this, if someone gives you a question, you can send them a really snappy, you know, 140 character or maximum or whatever it is, response with a simple solution, which is good. But when you're trying to get into discussions about science, it is the least productive place on the internet. Right. That's the way I yeah, see it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And as far as like from a patient standpoint, like I don't usually tell my patients about it because it's not a great place. Right them, you know, but I'm on it, especially with the experiment that I've been doing with the automated insulin delivery, like, you know, talking about it on those, it's super important. And, you know, for that stuff to get out and it's sort of, you know, the low carb being low carb as a type one is controversial. We just published a paper on that recently with a group at Harvard that we paired up with. um, I really don't understand why that's controversial. I'm sorry, you can't. She rolls recording. her eyes. So I, oh my God. <laughs> it shouldn't be. Oh, by the way, that's how we yeah. managed type one before insulin existed. And just mm. for the record, insulin was invented by an orthopedic specialist. So mm. it's not out of the realm of what we do. Um, it shouldn't be controversial. Um, and so we need more studies and science, of course, to understand people can get themselves into trouble and Type 1 diabetes is a day-to-day, you know, like challenge at times. And I have it, so I'm sort of on autopilot, especially now with this automated insulin delivery. I haven't gotten sick yet since I've started using it. Um, And so I'm curious to see because when you get sick, the wheels sort of come off and it becomes a whole different thing with insulin resistance and how do you dose and how do you stay safe. And, you know, I have a really good friend that was a pediatric neonatal neurologist who died of a hypoglycemic event, you know, super smart woman. And, you know, she died because of, you know, overutilizing insulin. And so, you know, all of those things are factors. My goal is to make it all as easy as possible. And then that's where, you know, the low carbohydrate diet has, if you add low carbohydrate diet with quality sleep, high intensity interval training and strength training. And then now the automated insulin, like for me, this is the closest I've gotten to a cure short of there being a cure. And, you know, as we talk to the beta cell scientists, like it's, there's not, you know, some people say, Oh, five years from now we'll have a solution. And others say like, not in my lifetime. So the the title of this episode should be Carrie Diolis, how to cure diabetes. Yeah, no. Oh. <laughs> no. Clear, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, when our paper came out, that was one of the things that came up is somebody said low carb diet cures type one diabetes. They're like, no, we did not yeah. say that. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, the media said that. We're like, none of the reputable media people said that. That was not a thing. It just makes what it reputable easier. media people apart from. Well, me. yeah, there you go. <laughs> not a cure, but it makes the day to day so much easier, Mm. you know? So my A1C ranges from 4.6 to 5.2. And do I think it needs to be that low? Not necessarily, Mm. but if I start to increase the carb from where I'm at, then I have to pay attention to my diabetes more. And I have other things going on in my life with my kids and my husband and my patients that I wanted to give my attention to rather than what's my blood sugar, what's my blood sugar, what's my blood sugar. So Carrie, this has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed learning about you and talking to you. It's, uh, I'm really excited about um, you know publishing this. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, for all of the listeners, to find the, the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Carrie. That's C-A-R-R-I-E. Uh, and to get a full list of podcast episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. 
And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get a bunch of goodies, including number one, a free ebook of podcast transcripts with some of my top guests like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. Number two, a free high intensity training business checklist to help you get more clients in your business. And number three, a free high intensity training Google Sheet to help you track and improve your training progress. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all in one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field.